If I were to say, don't be a fool, you might think I'm referring to just somebody that's uh, irresponsible. Don't be a person who acts unintelligently. To act foolish would be like to act in haste or not thinking about the ramifications or the outcome of one's decisions. Some would say it's the one that doesn't have common sense. As my mom and dad used to say, they have no horse sense. They're foolish. But the biblical definition of fool is not quite that. The biblical definition of a fool is the one who denies God. The person who denies God, in Psalm 14, 1, it says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Therefore, to be foolish, biblically speaking, is to deny God. To deny God in your heart, through your heart, and your actions, and your words. God considers one to be the supreme fool who opposes him, who denies him. Not just in their thinking, but in their pattern of living. A fool uses his own reasoning. A fool uses his own desires to cause him to deny that which is the truth, to deny God's very existence. A fool wants to wear grave clothes still. A fool hates God. A fool loves lust that comes from the world. A fool loves darkness rather than light. Those who are foolish, they love putting on lying, putting on unrighteous anger, putting on stealing and unwholesome words and the wrath towards other people. A fool wants to do his own will, and in the end, his foolishness is ruinous. Proverbs 19.3 says, The foolishness of man ruins his way, and his heart rages against the Lord. A fool is quick-tempered, short-fused, perverse speech coming out of him all the time, disobedient to his parents, disobedient to those above him in authority, pushing back against the discipline of even God. And if I was to look backwards to the, the letter we've been through so far, you would say that a fool walks unworthily, a fool is prideful, a fool causes disunity, a fool goes with the world ways, a fool hates God, and a fool hates light, and a fool loves darkness. Turn with me to Matthew 7 real quick. We're going to jump on Ephesians 5.15 in a minute. But Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, I think is a good foundational point for us to think about this. Matthew 7, verse 24, Jesus is telling a contrasting parable about two men building houses. Matthew 7, verse 24, follow along with me. Jesus is speaking, he says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell. And the floods came, and the winds blew, and slammed against that house, yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and slammed against that house, And it fell, and great was its fall. So this is the story of the fool and the wise. The fool built his house, what? On sand. He built his house, his life on sand. It's easy to dig in the sand. The foundation went up quick. The house took shape very fast. And the fool thought, who's the fool now? The wise guy's taking forever. I'm ignoring all the rules of building. I'm ignoring what the designer said I should do. And look. My thing's coming together quick. And when he was done, he said, look at my house. I'm done faster. It looks good. And that guy over there trying to do it the right way, building his house on the rock, he's barely started. And the wise man also built a house. He built his house, his life, on the rock. He followed the designer. He followed the architect, the mechanical engineer's instructions to a T. He painstakingly made sure every pylon was anchored into the solid bedrock, every girder, every beam fastened together with the highest grade hardware. It was hard work. And even at times he would say, this seems overkill. He might even think to himself, the engineer is a little over-engineering this one. But then he thought to himself, he must know something I don't know, and he kept building it. 
the proper way. And then both men's efforts were put to the test. A great storm, and that's the trials of life, the temptations by the evil one into man's life. And the fool's house fell because it's built on the sand and there was no structure to hold. And the wise man felt the pressure of the wind. He was beat up a bit, got some water damage. Some sheetrock has to be replaced. But it was still standing. You see, Jesus tells us this little parable to tell us the difference between two men and two builds, two lives. And the answer to the two men and the two builds of the two lives is what they did with his word. What they did with he was telling them. He said, everyone who hears the words of mine, reads from the Bible, and acts on them, meaning everyone who is obedient to me and the word that I say, what he should do, what he shouldn't do, where he should go, where he shouldn't go, how he should live, how he shouldn't live, how he's going to enter the kingdom of heaven, how he's not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. The one who is wise knows God, loves God, obeys God. The one who repents is wise. The one who believes in Christ is the one who is wise. The one who is being sanctified in the renewing of their mind, Romans 12, 2, with the Spirit's help is wise. The one who brings God's love into the world is wise and puts off earthly lusts and wraps himself in light, the light of Christ. He's truly wise. Yet the fool, he's the one that does not listen. He's the one who will not obey. He's the one who flippantly says, what does the engineer know? What does the architect know? I know better. Look how easy it is to dig this. I'm going to be done and still have time to rest. It's going to be cheaper, faster. I can do the things I want my way. I can, I can, I, I, I. I don't need God. And Jesus says this, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act to them, that's the fool. He's the foolish man who built his house in the sand, and the fool's house, meaning his life, fell in the storm, and great was its fall. So as we enter this text this morning in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15, the way of wisdom and the way of life is the way of God. The way of wisdom and the way of life is the way of God. Godly wisdom is recognizing the truth is from God, and God is the truth, and wisdom is showing by conviction and behavior in one's life to obey him, as Jesus told us in a parable. So when a man or a woman is saved, they move from foolishness, and they're placed in a position of wisdom, God's wisdom. And just as one uh, Christian has said before, if you walk worthy, then you should walk humbly. And if you walk in unity and you're separate from the world and you walk in God's love and you walk in his purity and you walk in his light, then you'll be in his wisdom. So let's look at the text at hand this morning. Chapter 5, verse 15. Paul continues, verse 15, Therefore, be careful how you walk. Not as, as unwise men, but as wise. Making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And I would just say, be careful, right? I gave that the title of the sermon. Be careful, build your house on the rock. Be careful how you walk your life. Number one in your outlines, let's just jump into it. We have three points, so we should be done early. Probably not. Three verses, three points. Number one, watch your walk. Verse 15, watch your walk. Therefore, we know what therefore is. Therefore, be careful how you walk. Therefore, based on what I already said in verses 8 through 14, the preceding passage, the, the talking about putting off darkness and putting on light. Therefore, be careful how you walk or how you live. Not as unwise men, but as a wise men, right? If we are living as children of the light, walking in God's light, then we should be careful how we walk and live in that light, right? Careful, the original Greek term is akrobos. Akrobos means to look at something very carefully, investigating it with alertness and great care. And we need to take heed to how we live because the story that we're told outside these walls today is live however you want to live. What type of fruit is on the branches of your life? We're a tree, right? And what type of tree are we? In fact, Paul's saying, therefore, could actually reach further back 
If you just go back to verse 1 and 2 of chapter 5, you can look with me. It says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us and offering and sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Therefore, if you're imitators of God, therefore, as if he loved you with a great sacrifice, be careful how you live now. Be careful how you walk. If you are a tree, the fruit on your branches decide or prove what type of tree you are. So we need to be careful how we walk. Be careful how you build your house. You and I are believers and we must build our houses on the rock. We must build our houses on the rock, which means our lives need to be bolted with the rock of obedience. A lot of people say, Jesus is the rock, that's true. But in that parable, the one who hears my words and obeys them is the one building on the rock. So we need to build our lives on the rock of obedience. That's true wisdom. That's truly wise. And how do we do that, right? Just tell us how to do it, John. How should we then live? He says, just walk or live, not as unwise, but as wise. Simple. Just follow what I said, right? We must put on God's wisdom. We must walk in the wisdom of him, not in the world's wisdom. But even as believers, we battle to want to do it our way. Like the guy building the house. Maybe this is overkill. Maybe I don't need this exact setup, God. We must put on God's wisdom. We must walk in that wisdom. We must not walk in the world's wisdom. It does matter how you live because how you live determines who you are and what you are. And we need to be asking God for his wisdom to show through us to other people. And all we have to do is ask for it. We already know this. James 1.5 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, can I get a hand showing hands? Who lacks wisdom? Okay, thank you for being honest. Who knows lying is a sin if you didn't raise your hand? (laughs) James 1.5 says, if you lack wisdom, ask God for it. Because where does wisdom come from? Ask him. He will give it to you. He will give it without reproach. And guess what? Just open this. You already have it. Steve Lawson said one time, you want to hear God's audible voice, then just read this out loud. There it is. You want God's wisdom? Read this. God in his word commands us to grow in wisdom. In 2 Peter 3.18, it says, Grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior, to be to him the glory from now into the day of eternity. Amen. So we are the church that is Christ's church, and we are Christians, Christ's little followers, little Christs, and we're supposed to walk according to his way, and walk as one and be separate from the world system. That is true wisdom. And we need to love with the sacrificial love. And we need to be a light out into the dark world. Then we will understand the only way to do that is for God's wisdom to come in here and for what we think to get out. That's why it tells us to renew our minds. However, just because we're all sitting here in church doesn't mean we're all Christians either, does it? The truth is that no one can get salvation without God's wisdom. You don't get salvation by just osmosis. You can plant a tree into an orchard of some other type of tree and you don't become an almond if you're an orange tree. You don't just become it by being around almonds. You need God's wisdom if you're not a believer and no one around you may even know you're not a believer but you know in your heart you don't believe. You can't become a believer, you can't gain salvation without the wisdom of God, no more than you can be saved without his righteousness, or without his electing you, or without without his redeeming you, or without his producing sanctification in you. And sadly, uh, the Christian kind of landscape right now is pushing cheap grace, easy believism. And it says things like this, you don't need to do anything, just accept Christ, like it's all on you. Just accept him. And and they don't talk about anything else, no sin, no repentance, as if Jesus is some genie in a bottle. Once you allow him to come into your life, then he'll just give you everything to make your life happy and easier. If that's the case, the guy building on the sand had it right. This is easy doing it this way. Cheap grace teaches that you don't have to do anything. Just believe, just accept. Just say a 14-word sinner's prayer. Do you really think a 14-word sinner's prayer is God's wisdom in totality? Do you think that places you 
regardless of what your heart is, regardless of what you do in your life, you just said some magic mantra. However, this is a scaled back gospel in its foolishness. And the reason I bring it up is because you may have failed in that just because you walked forward at some crusade, just because you did something, you need to read God's word and, sa- and understand cheap grace is not in there. You'd have to skip over large portions of many books of the Bible. Matter of fact, uh, almost every book that Paul penned with God inspiring him, you'd have to miss the whole few chapters of every book he wrote. You must renounce and you must forsake sin. That is wisdom. You must turn to God and turn from your sinful ways and seek righteousness and seek a life in him, repenting and then believing. There's even some people that say repentance is works. But Jesus says, repent. And Paul says, repent, because that's when grace is shown on you. Titus 2, 11 and 12, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to do what? What does it say in verse 12 of Titus 2? To deny ungodliness and worldly desires. That's repenting and turning to him. To live sensibly, righteously, and godly. How we live matters. Live righteously and godly. That's true wisdom. There must be repentance if you're not a believer. That's the bad news of the gospel. has to be given first. There is a holy God. You are a sinner. You have a huge chasm. You have a problem. And you need that wisdom. Many men have tried to cut out that part of the gospel, and it's not the gospel anymore. We're saved from something. Jesus Christ makes it very clear in the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5 of Matthew, the Beatitudes. He says, the first and necessary mark of salvation is the one who what? Mourns over their sin. Mourns over it. Repents. Hungers and thirsts for righteousness. He makes the U-turn. And you might, you might remember the Apostle Paul made these things clear at the beginning of this letter. If you just look back at Ephesians 1, just a few, maybe a page back, maybe two pages back. If you have the large print Bible, maybe ten pages back. Ephesians 1, 8 and 9, he lavished on us, God did, in all wisdom and insight. He made known to us the mystery of his will. How did you become a believer? Because he gave you that. He gave you that wisdom and insight and made known to you the mystery of his will according to his kind intention which he purposed in him. That's Christ. You have to know the wisdom of God to be saved. And if you're here this morning and that's, that's you, you don't know him, then you don't just need to watch your work your walk, watch your life. You need a life. You need to turn. You need to repent. So we bring attention to the fact that most of us are Christians, though, here, and that this is written to Christians, but I don't want to miss the opportunity to tell you if you're not in Christ, as the vernacular goes of today, you need to get a life, a life in Christ. That will only come through the wisdom of God found in the scriptures, and then you must repent and turn. That's obedience to him. That's building your house on the foundation of the rock. And we are believers, and we're supposed to be sanctified, and we're supposed to be moving towards Christ's likeness, away from the old man, more to the new man, and maturing Christ. And we say, do I have to keep learning? Do I have to keep getting more wisdom? Do I have to keep moving? The answer is yes, yes, and yes. If you looked at Luke 252, even the Lord himself kept increasing in wisdom. Jesus Christ, in his earthly life, kept increasing in wisdom. If God incarnate, Jesus Christ, needed to increase in godly wisdom, wouldn't it be safe to say that no one in this room has arrived yet with the wisdom category? You, you, not, you don't have all you need. Does anyone here believe that they don't need to grow anymore in wisdom? And their wisdom of God's word, you, you're fine, you got the word down, no problem. You don't need to grow in the wisdom of your own sinfulness. There's times when I pray and say, God, forgive me of the things I don't even know that I'm doing this wrong. I'm ignorant that this is sin. So, what I would say is you need to ask yourself, how am I doing? How much godly wisdom do I really have? And how much godly wisdom do I really need? And how much godly wisdom do I exercise in my daily life with obedience? And what do I push back at? Colossians 1.9 says, For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you will be filled with the knowledge of his will. 
You need to still be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. That's what it says in Colossians 1.9. That's what Paul was praying for those at Colossae. That's what I pray for you. That's what you should be praying for me and each other and yourself. Chapter 3, verse 16 of Colossians says, Let the word of Christ richly dwell in you. So it's bubbling up and coming out of you. Like Spurgeon said, if you get cut, you bleed bibline. The Bible comes out of you. Because that's God's wisdom for you. And you need to increase in it still more. And so do I. And he just goes on to say, all this with wisdom and teaching and marching one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness into your hearts for God. Because he's willing to give us the wisdom, we need to be asking for the wisdom, and we need to be walking in the wise path. The truth is that every believer begins their new life in Christ, amen, with all the wisdom that you need, actually. You have it all already. Yet the paradox here is that we're called by the word of God to still grow in that wisdom and mature into it still, continually being more faithful, more active in obedience, more serving him, more serving one another, more denying self. And that's why it says here by Paul in verse 15, therefore, be careful, be very examining your life in in, in a scrupulous way to walk or live in a wise way. Not unwise. Why does he say that? Because we do foolish things still. We do foolish things. And to walk means to live, just like building a house meant the guy's life, meaning live, not as unwise Christians. Amen? We do that all the time. We're as unwise Christians sometimes. We know better, and we still do it. We're ignorant to it, and we still do the things against him. And we're ignorant to God's truth, and we're ignorant to Satan's schemes, and we're ignorant to the sin that so easily entangles us, or we're knowingly going to it, but we're being unwise. And when you are unwise as a Christian, that's akin to being foolish. And a fool is the one who does not know God, right? And I'm thinking, okay, well, I know God, so I'm not a fool, biblically speaking, the definition. But understand this, when you act foolish, you're reverting back to the position you used to be. The old man, the old grave clothes of sin. And that's truly foolish indeed, actually. Titus 3.3 says, for we also once were foolish ourselves. Amen. We were foolish. It says we were disobedient. We were deceived. We were enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy and hateful, hating one another. He's talking about Christians. He's talking about you and me. And and, and it's sad to think about, even in my own life, but just as much as it's true that a fool says in his heart, there is no God, that's a non-believer. Equally true, the fool says in his heart, I can still live in a lifestyle which matches when I used to believe there was no God. The old man. The old way. Before salvation. When you were still part of the sons of disobedience, still separated from him, with no wisdom, no salvation wisdom at all. And, you know, I asked myself this week, are we people who are marked by Christ, I'm a Christ follower, and yet I still act like a fool, and I run back to the very things that he saved me from? That's what we do all the time. That's why we still need the wisdom. We still need obedience. We still need the spirit to move with the word to help us renew our minds. Because, Sally, at times that's what we all do. We act a fool and go back to the things we were saved from. We put the grave clothes back on. That's what Paul's saying. You need to be careful. You need to be circumspect. How you walk, how you live, don't be a fool. Don't live as unwise. Because we do that. Christians, we're not immune from playing the fool, actually. Who did something foolish even this week? Even yesterday? Even this morning? Even right now while I'm preaching? In actuality, that's exactly what we all do all the time. We live in disobedience and we play the fool. And we battle. That is what sanctification is. Battling the old. Trying to put on the new. You need the the Spirit's help. You have the Word of God. You need to to relinquish control to Him. Which we'll be addressing in a couple weeks. Be Spirit-filled and Spirit-led. And Paul addressed this to the Galatians, exactly the reality of this. He, He brazenly says to them in Galatians 3. Actually, turn with me there really quick. This is a good example for us on some huge thing. Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. Imagine getting this letter from a, a, 
a pastor who you loved and cared about, a man of God who you were taught from and trusted. And you get this letter, and Galatians 3, 1 says, you foolish Galatians, you foolish John Jordan, who has bewitched you? That means you are bewitched. And no, it's not, I dream of genie, okay? You are doing something that it acts like you're not saved at all anymore. You're changing and you're moving back to the old man. You're being fools, pushing God away. Who has bewitched you? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as, as crucified? You saw Jesus die on the cross. You accepted Jesus as the way. Now, who has bewitched you? Who has pulled you back the wrong way? Verse 3, jump over to verse 3. Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit? God gave you grace through the Spirit who redeemed you, regenerated you, and now you're going to be perfected by the flesh? Now you're going to say Jesus plus something else? What's wrong with you, Galatians, he's saying? And this is what happens to each and every one of us, if we fail to hold on to the wisdom of God, they let go of the wisdom, they went to the unwise territory, and then somebody come and taught doctrine that was not salvation by faith alone and Christ alone. It was Christ plus something else. And they fell prey to a heresy. And we're saying, no, 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 we're, we're well taught. I understand my Bible. I'm not going to fall to that. I'm not going to do what those Gentile believers did and the Judaizers said, you need the ceremonial law plus Jesus. I'm not going to fall for that. It's Jesus alone. I mean, it's on the building out there in the little window. Christ alone. I mean, I, I got the tattoo. I'm not going to fall that. And the truth is, you're in danger zone if you think, I'm well read in the scriptures. I'm well taught in the scriptures. And I'm not going to fall for that heretical teaching over there. I'm not going to do it. And maybe that's true. Maybe you understand. And maybe you won't fall in that big way to some false doctrine like that. But many of us... We understand the word too well, and we fail to follow it. We're followers of Christ, and we play a fool when we put our heart's affection in the wrong place. And we don't follow him in all things. And no, we're not going to some huge heresy, but we're playing the fool in all these other ways. Let me give you an example that might hit home. You fall for money. You fall for money. No, it takes two to live. My wife must work. Somebody else must run the household. Somebody else must raise my kids. No, I need the next level. I need the next house. I need to be in the right neighborhood. I need, I need, I need. And maybe the almighty dollar causes one of us here to fall into foolishness. Amen? It did me when I was a young man. It could still too today. So no, I'm not going to fall for Jesus plus something else, but I'm going to fall for money, 1 Timothy 6, 9. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation. Who would like to get rich? You don't have to raise your hand, but you know. You fall into temptation. Why? Because Satan has a string to pull on you, and it's a snare, and it says many foolish and harmful desires plunge men into ruin and destruction because you become a fool, even as a Christian, when you start chasing money. So you may not fall to the heresy of Jesus plus something else, but you will fall to this. And many of us have. It's tragic in the lives of so many Christians, including some represented in this room who foolishly fail to take God and his word seriously in, in certain areas. You believe lies like I can look, but I cannot touch. That's a lie from Satan. If I could just have this, I'll be happy. That's a lie from Satan. We fail to stay away from everything that he warns us against, which is the wisdom of God, and we're being foolish. And there's no excuse for us to live that way because we have the Spirit, we have the Word, we've been saved, we got the big wisdom point. I got Jesus, and the wisdom's handed to me as such a great sacrifice, but then I turn my back on him in little areas of my life. So we all are in this bag together. We generally want to know God's truth more and more and more. And then obedient to it is what matters. Building your house on the rock. You have the resources. I can't do it. I know. That's why Jesus sent the Holy Spirit. I can't understand this. I know. That's why Jesus gave the Holy Spirit. I can't live this way. I know. That's why Jesus sent the Holy Spirit. We have within us the resources. We have within us a position. We have within us, right before us, the good and innocent, what is evil, scriptures. This is the wise thing from God that we have. And what's the thing that sits on the shelf collecting dust? It's the word. It's the word. 
John 7, 17 says, if anyone is willing to do his will, he will know of the teaching, whether it's of God. How are you going to know if some teachings of God or not? You have to know the word of God. And the foolishness of the world and acting a fool doesn't just happen prior to salvation. It happens post-salvation. And you might even step back and just look at the world and think about all the religions all of the world. And I thought of this even this morning. If you looked at every religious or cult or religion or ideology through the history of mankind, you would find people that were willing to give all they had. You would find people willing to do anything and everything to live a disciplined life, not to stray from their ideology, their idolatry their ideology, they're an idolatry. They will, not pull, they will not be pulled from their belief system. They could train themselves to walk on beds of coals, uh, on lay on beds of nails. They could beat their bodies into submission, literally, with blood coming down, whipping themselves, cutting themselves. Luther tried it by going up and, up and down stone stairs on his knees till they were bloody. Yet we, at times, hold on to the Lord. We hold on to the Word. Unlike those false religious people, we hold on to this, which is frail weak hands. Frail. But may God and may the Spirit of God, may we pray for wisdom to come, that we may take his holy word and that he will strengthen our grip to this, to not let it go. Increase our wisdom in this. Increase our ability to obey out of the wisdom of this, to seek him, to, to hold us to his truth. Because he loves us. And he's given us all that we need, literally. And at times, we push back and lose grip. May he help us. As one preacher put it, if you ignore your garden, it will become overrun with weeds. Amen? And the fruit will fail. If you forget your body, amen, it will vegetate and it will degenerate. Therefore, if you lack attention to the interior of your life, most importantly, your relationships will mean personal decline. Consequently, we must not ignore the fact that many times we tend to degenerate towards what? Evil, towards the old man, back to the old way, if we don't attend to God's wisdom. Found where? Right here in his word. And we wonder why we're in this predicament. We wonder why this stuff is happening to us. We wonder why we can't have peace and we don't have contentment because we've strayed from his wisdom. We need to seek and desire to understand and to walk in his will for our life. He disciplines us because he loves us. He tells us which way to go because he loves us. He tells us which way not to go because he loves us. That's true wise living. This is building your house on the rock, obeying this. So watch your walk. Takes us number two in your outlines. Watch your time. Watch your walk and watch your time. Verse 16. Paul goes on to say, making the most of your time because the days are evil. I'll ask the guys this question. How many of you in your home right now have a project you started? You know where I'm going with this. And it's unfinished still to this day. It's not done. Not done. Come on. I think we all have that as guys. And some ladies, you can go there too. But somewhere in your house, there's a piece of trim missing. No, I have not been at your house. I'm just saying that's, that's probably true. There's an area that isn't fully painted the new color behind some, you know, something else that's blocking getting in there, a refrigerator or something. Maybe there's a little piece of tile missing behind the door. I think of my own house. There's a large empty piece of wood right, right where the hearth stone's supposed to be underneath my fireplace. Plywood's flammable, right? It's supposed to be stone. So it's not uncommon that we don't always finish what we've begun. I mean, guys are notorious for this. Something gets in the way. And many times it's yourself. That's what got in the way. I got in my own way. And many in this room, I'm sure, have unfinished projects. And many of you might have dreams of what you wanted to do in life, and they never became a reality. We have things we've tried to do in life. We never finish. However, none of those things have eternal value. But everyday Christian life can also be resembling this trend. We have unfinished spiritual projects in all of our Lives. And what this is trying to tell us is how many fail to use their time wisely for the Lord. Just scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. 
How many times have we not been productive, not recognizing God's moving, not recognizing the spiritual opportunity? I told the Bible study there tonight, when you pray for God to give you a gospel opportunity, then you're like surprised. Oh, it really happened. I was stuck in this long line and I was talking to this person. Well, that person was going to be there whether you prayed it or not. But prayer is to align you to his will, not to change God's will. So now you're looking for that person and there's the person. But when you don't pray it, the long line's still there, the person's still there, but you're saying, hurry up, I got to go. Missed opportunities, unfinished spiritual projects. Or do you master your time? Maybe you're like, I master my time. Hours and the days and the weeks. But realize, just like those projects in your house, guys, that's not finished, a person can't finish what he started without taking advantage of the opportunities that come to you. And you can't look for opportunities if you're not seeking them. And you're not seeking them if not asking God to show them to you. And if you're not asking God to show them to you, you're sliding towards unwise foolishness. It's true in business, it's true if you're going to make music, it's true if you're going to paint a great piece of art, if you're going to create some new product, it's true in your health life, it's true in your fitness, it's true in your spiritual life as well. We must take and we must make the most of our time. And each of us only has so much time left. Our days are not only numbered, but the Lord and the scriptures tell us our days are like a vapor. When you get out of the shower and if you wear glasses, your glasses steam up in the bathroom and then the steam's gone. That's your life. That's your life. You're here today, you're gone tomorrow, and it's unwise. Actually, it's downright foolish to waste your life. It's foolishness as a Christian to chase the world or chase what you want or the carnal pleasures of your life or the pleasures of this world or your little niche that you want to have, that you want to do. It's unwise. It's foolish. It doesn't match your tree. It doesn't match what you're building on the rock. And it'll show itself. And Paul is telling us you need to be making the most of your time because the days are evil. Does this mean that we need to track every second, like on some graph, every minute of our day? No. But I think what he's trying to say, although that's not a horrible idea, but I think what he's trying to say on a global point here is that time is... And the original is not chronos. We get chronological. That's not the, the word used here by Paul. He doesn't say, watch your chronos. He says, watch your keros. Your keros is a measurement a lot of time, a fixed season, your life boundaries. I believe he's emphasizing that God is sovereign over your, to your total life. From the beginning to the end, he set the boundaries. His will has put something on each and every one of us, and he's gifted you, and, he's, and you've seen he's given the, the spirit to you, and you have the word given to you, and you have the opportunities to serve him given to you. And that time to serve him, to use the gifts, to walk in those ways, exists only within the boundaries that he has set, not beyond. So, we should live in such a way to expect that we have an end date and we live for today, knowing that we're not going to go beyond that predetermined time. You want to fulfill his will in your life. You want to walk in his will and fulfill his power through your life to shine out there. So we have to strive to walk as those who need to die to self every day, and we need to strive to live in such a way to maximize the time for his purpose, for what he wants. God does not intend for us to give him one and a half hours on Sunday morning. That's not his intention. We need to walk in a way that's wising up. Not be foolish. The English phrase, making the most of, comes from a singular word in the Greek. And the singular word in the Greek basically meant to buy back something. To buy it back. It was used to like buy a slave off the slave market and then set him free. I've bought his freedom. I'm buying his freedom. So you need and I need to redeem our time to buy it back. God set the boundaries, and we're in the middle of this two points, the beginning and the end, and we need to buy back our time, buy it up, totally be sold out and devoted to the Lord. That's the idea of what he's saying. And you can think of the areas where you waste it, but you need to buy that time back. I do too. What part of your life do you need to redeem in order to spend for the service of the Lord? I don't know what it is. Maybe it's Xbox or Angry Birds or something. I don't know. 
In other words, if we fail to do this, if we fail to guard our time and buy our time back, we need to walk wisely, not foolishly. And if we don't listen to this, then we're fools. We're fools. And the greatest way for a believer to be foolish in your life is not to accept what God has for you. And for a person that's not a believer, the foolish thing in your life is not to accept Christ at all. But when we do accept Christ, it should change our lives. It should show in our lives what kind of tree we are, where we're building our house, if it's on the rock or the sand. And the greatest way for a believer to be this way is to be disobedient after our salvation. And that's where we all struggle. And not only are you being disobedient after salvation, the next level of spiritual fullness is we waste our time. And we're given opportunity after opportunity. We waste it away. And they're there for his glory. We're not showing him glory. And we're wasting it away. It's foolish to waste your life on trivial pursuits in your golf game, okay? It's trivial to waste your life on half-hearted service to God. Well, I'll, I'll help a little bit here and there where it doesn't affect my schedule. Read the last book of the Bible. It's very dangerous to be lukewarm for the Lord, isn't it? He spits lukewarm things out of his mouth. Those that say in Matthew 7, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these things? And he goes, I don't know you. The call from Scripture and the call from Paul and the call from our Lord is redeem your walk, your life in him, and then redeem the time. Die to what you want. Take full advantage of every opportunity that he wants and spend your life for his glory. That's something that gets treasure in heaven, right? Moth doesn't destroy it. Rust doesn't destroy it. Galatians 6.10 says, So then, while we have the opportunity, while today is still today, let us do good to all people, especially to those who are in the household of faith. Why? Because we're deeming the time. How much time are we given by Almighty God? I don't know. I don't know. My dad died at 45. I don't know. I passed him already. For his own reasons and for God's own pleasure, he allows some of his children to live long into old age and serve them all the way into their 90s, into 100, and on some of us he just grants a year. Some believers, a few weeks, some a few moments. The point is not how much, is what we're doing with how much we have right now. The point is that none of us knows the allocation of time given by God and we, we need to understand, and we need to trust him. We need to spend our lives for him and, and spend it for his purpose and his glory. And that's really being wise. And if you're Noah, you live 950 years, great. If you're a saint who gets up to 100, great. If you're Robert Murray McShane and you die when you're 30, great. If you're accepted by Christ in a young age and maybe you're martyred for your faith on your 16th birthday, which happens. We have to guard our lives we have to put on the wisdom of God, redeem the time so as not to waste the time. There are many places in Scripture that warn us about wasting time because we will never, ever, ever have the time we think. Never. James warns all of us. You can turn with me to James chapter 4. I think this is good for us because especially us as Christians, you're like, oh, we got time. What's the rush? We have time. It's not in my spreadsheet. James chapter 4, verse 13, James warns of this. He says, come now, you who say, now this is you, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and we'll engage in business and we'll make a profit. In other words, all your plans, all your, the next year I'm going to do this and five-year plan I'm going to do this and 10-year plan I'm going to do that. And he says in verse 14, yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow or if you'll even have a life tomorrow because you ain't God. And then he says, as I was pointing out before, you are just a vapor. When water gets steamed past 212, it becomes this little bit of vapor, and it sticks on something as condensation, and it goes back to water, runs somewhere, and dries up, and it's gone. That's what he's saying. You're just a vapor. You're here for a little while. You vanish. So you have to ask your own self, what are you putting off for tomorrow? What thing does God want you to do that you're putting off for tomorrow, or the next day, or maybe later? And maybe you're not coming to Christ to begin with, and you're like somebody that told me one time, well, I can come on my deathbed, right? Is that your plan? You're not a believer, but you might come on your deathbed? What things does the Lord want you to do as you are a Christian and you're procrastinating? If you look up procrastination in Webster's, my picture could be there. My picture. 
I'm sure some of you have your picture in there. We just put it off and put it off, and the principle is true for every one of us. There's no assurance tomorrow, so realize that if you're not a believer, yes, you don't know if you'll have tomorrow to become a believer, so you need to do and deal with that now. But if you are a believer, you can't wait to serve him. You can't wait to live him. You can't wait to show the light of him out to the world. You can't wait to tell your loved ones about Christ, to to give the great commission out to those people around you. You don't have more time. You don't know what time you have. We must make the most of every opportunity. And he continues to say that the world system is underneath the sway of the evil one who opposes God. And as Christians, Satan desires to do what? Hinder you, stop you, stunt you, push you back, tempt you. Satan desires to hamstring the work of Christ. And Paul's saying, make the most of your time because the days are evil. And when you think about it, can you imagine what God must think? He elected me. He redeemed me through his son being sacrificed on a cross. He sealed me with his spirit. He indwells me with his spirit. He loved me sacrificially. He atoned for me and wrapped me in light. He adopted me as a child. He walked with me every day of my life, and I just ignore him at times. Half-heartedly taking up opportunities he sends my way. We must, as children of God, live every day filled with the good things of God and the righteous things of God, doing the things to glorify God. God, because the days are evil. The days are evil. And remember, the apostle understands exactly what kind of evil they lived in. Those in Ephesus that they are living in this corrupt and wicked, wicked and debauched society. They're believers who he is writing to. They're surrounded by paganism and greediness and immorality and cult idol worship and extremely sexualized sinfulness. Does that sound like any time in history at all? Surrounded by the world of carnality, even on the way out the checkout stand at Nugget, even on the billboard signs all around us. We need to redeem the days, they're evil days, we need to redeem them for Christ, or we fall prey to them, one or the other, we'll be a fool or we'll be wise, and you must have a sense of urgency in your life. What's missing in, in preaching today is there's no urgency. You don't have tomorrow, you don't have this afternoon. We need a fire lit underneath us. I need a fire underneath me. We need to have some urgency. Because you know what? Every day is one day near. Everyone say, well, you think the Lord's coming back? You should be worried about when you're going to go to the Lord. That's what you should be worried about. Because chances are you're going to die and go to him before he comes down here. But what are you going to do with him is the question. What is he going to say to you? is the question. What is he going to say to me? Is he going to say, I've given you all this and you just wasted it away. I've done all this and you just pushed back and you want the foolishness of the world. Or is he going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Come and dine with me at my table forever. And those in Ephesus, they paid a price. And we, see it, we saw it in Revelation, the last the, the letter in chapter 2, that he commended them of this. The government of Rome was persecuting them. And if you read the accounts, they were being thrown to lions. They were being killed for sport. They were being stuck up on poles with pitch on them and burned alive for parties for Caesar. They were brutalized with intense cruelty. And those receiving this letter from Paul lived in evil times, and they were just growing more and more evil. In fact, if you read Revelation, it caused them to lose their first love. They walked away from Christ, their devotion to Christ, and Christ took away their lampstand, took away that church because they failed to repent and they failed to turn to him and love him. That's why I prayed that at the beginning, that we would not lose our love for him. We need to take this warning seriously as Christians. And I, I've been looking and reading through this passage and reading through commentaries and studying this passage and it just keeps landing on me. This is you too, John. This is you. If you look out and you watch the news and you're following the stuff with Israel, you're like, oh, the increasing evil is just coming more and more and more. If we don't hold on to the course, we're taken off the course. So we hold the course to the end. And we follow him to the end. And we will not be able to accomplish the things he called us to do if we're not following him and putting on his wisdom and putting off our foolishness. Build your house on the rock. That's all you got to do. It's not over-engineered. Build your house on the rock. Watch your walk. Watch your time. Verse 17. Number three, watch your mind. 
Verse 17, watch your mind. So then, do not be foolish. That's an understatement, right? Do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So then, in the light of that reality, don't be a fool. Paul's repeating and reinforcing what he's already said in verse 15. Be wise, not unwise. Be, have God's wisdom. Don't be foolish. Don't be foolish. Understand what God's will is. Understand his word for your life. Follow in it. Build your house on the rock. Seek the wisdom of God. Understand what he wants for you, and then you and I will be careful to walk that way and to watch our life that way, which expands to watching what time is used for that, redeeming every opportunity for the Lord. And in light of this urgency to make the most of our time would mean not to be foolish because foolishness pulls you the wrong way. Are you anxious for something? Are you worried about something? Are you fearful of something? Pervasive evil surrounding you at every moment and you're just crouched in a corner and it's getting worse and you need evangelism to go forth but I wish there was some Christian who would go out there and evangelize my family. I wish there was somebody or maybe John McNeff could go talk to this person. No, the Great Commission is for us to obey it. All of us. To not get overwhelmed by the society of the evil, not to withdraw from the evil, not to freeze in inactivity, but you and I, as far as Christ, need to have the proper sense of urgency to understand what God's will is for your life. And it's not one and done, you just sit at the beach now. I hear Christians tell me all the time, that's for you young ones to do. I did this when I was, when I was young, I did this. No, 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 no. There's no retirement from God in this life. And you would be well As one preacher of old said it, you'd be well if you burned out instead of rust out. Flame out. Because only his will is perfect, and only his will is the thing we should walk in, and it's the Lord's will that has the power for us to do any good and to be used in a righteous way for the kingdom of all, because God is perfect, his will is perfect, therefore we need to be wise and follow his will, not foolish and frozen thinking. Sometimes people say, I believe in election. It's the frozen chosen. We do nothing. We foolishly at times also frantically run in all kinds of directions, trying to do things for God that we think that we want to do without any love, without any thought of him at all, just like those in Ephesus. And we need to understand, we have to put the love of God as the proper internal motivation because we love him to then do what he says. Jesus says, if you love me, or what? Obey my commands. Build your house on the rock. So we have this new church here, Christ Church of the Valley, and it's easy to throw many programs. It's easy to have many projects and things we need to get involved in, and we're going to have what everyone else has on their social media posts. At every twist in the road, we have to have something to fix it, some program, some item, something. And we start working in the power of the flesh, and even though it's well-intentioned, even though we want it to be for God, we run ahead of God, we run beyond God's reach, further than he placed us. We're like Martha. Remember Martha and Mary? What does Martha and Mary show us? Martha's running around, banging some pots together, frustrated, angry at her sister. Why aren't you helping me? And what's Mary doing? Sitting at the Lord's feet. There's a time to be taught. There's a time to gain the wisdom. And then there's wise living to live out that wisdom. And it's been the work of so many churches to greatly add all these trivial things, trivial programs and activities that in the end, they don't do God's will. They're not looking for God's will. If anything, they've clothed and clouded the wisdom of God in their own will. For the sake of what? Expediency? Pragmatism, if I create a show up here, we can get people in here. If we get people in here, then God will save some people. Are we in charge of salvation? I don't think so. We want to accomplish things for God. You can accomplish nothing. God does everything. If you and I do this in our lives, if we follow him and walk in him and spend our time for him and watch our mind and we renew the wisdom that comes from him, then we start living in our own World, no. We put our own way aside. We live for him. But if we don't do that, we just go down that foolish road of selfishness and self-centeredness and self-strength. We need to learn how to follow his will and stay in his will. And I'm talking for us as believers, right? That's not the world. This is us. It's truly wisdom indeed if we're connected to him. That's when it's true wisdom. 
In the scriptures, we can find his perfect will. In the scriptures, you can find his authoritative will, his sufficient will. People say, I believe in the sufficiency of scripture. Do you? Do you do what it says? It's inerrant. Do you believe that? It's authoritative. Does your life reflect that? Does mine? I can say all the buzzwords. Scriptures, we find his perfect will. We find his authoritative will. We find his sufficient will. And I would say that God's will for our lives is first and foremost that we go to him through Christ. That's salvation. And that each person apart from him needs to be saved and brought into the kingdom through the Son. Then God's will is after your believer to be spirit-filled, to live a sanctified life apart for him. Then God's will is that you be renewed by the mind that's putting the word in here, transformed into Christ. Christ likeness every day more and more God's will is that you be wise and submissive to him and growing in wisdom and submissive to leaders he's placed over us God's will may be that we might have to suffer then and I believe that's coming to the church we might have to suffer we might have to experience persecution because of him Within everything, we live in such a way that we give thanks to him in John MacArthur's little book it's out there for sale it's called God's will, semicolon, found. God's will, found. And he states that a person is to be saved and then sanctified and then submissive and then suffering and then thankful. Then you're in God's will. That's God's will. We are God's. He redeemed us. And he wants us to be under his control, under his will, and merge his will into our will, then we love what he loves and hate what he hates and want to do what he wants us to do. Therefore, do whatever you want if you're in that position. The problem is we push back and we like the foolish things in our own heart sometimes. And if you want an example of this happening, the supreme example, the fulfillment of this is found in Jesus Christ himself. In John 5, 19, it says, Therefore Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself. I'm not doing it my way. I don't like Frank Sinatra's song, My Way. Unless it's something he sees the Father doing. Whatever the Father does, these things the Son is doing in like manner. Just follow God, follow God, follow God. Jesus is showing us the pattern. Jesus in John 4, 34 says, Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him. To do the Father's will is my daily food. To accomplish his work. To build my house on the rock. You ask yourself, what is your food? What are you building on? We must agree with Peter as he said in 1 Peter 4, 1 and 2. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same purpose. That he did. That he lived. That his house was built on. Because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so to live the rest of the time in the flesh is no longer for the lust of men, but for the will of God. You live for the will of God, not your own will. You have to watch your walk, watch your life, watch your time, watch your mind. And and if I was to ask you this question, how should every one of us react to this teaching this morning? It's varied, but not much. What's the proper response to this teaching? You need to ask yourself, what am I going to do with this teaching this morning? We see an example of the answer, how we must do, summed up in the words of King David himself in Psalm 101. This is what the response should be to this morning's teaching. David said this, I will sing of mercy and judgment. Unto thee, O Lord, will I sing. I will have myself wisely. I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. You can't be perfect, but don't be a fool. Be wise in the Lord. Build your house on the rock. Then it will stand, and then it will be in glory forever. Let's pray.